My name is Rula Parthenew, and we're here in my studio. Uh, welcome. Um, despite being surrounded by paint and paintbrushes, uh, my work is predominantly sculptural, and uh, and I mostly revolves around uh, questions of the replica. I'm interested in the replica as a tool for exploring uh, cognitive processes and perception and the difference between um, what we see and what we think we see and how we read and decipher our environment. And I would say my work really exists in, in that cognitive gap between, um, uh, between sort of the space of our assumptions and, and uh, what, what, is actually, what information is actually presented in front of us. My studio is uh, on the ground floor of our home. Uh, I have uh, sort of a space that I, I, I work in and, and stage uh, my work. I also have a kind of more like a clean room that has some tools and then we also have a workshop set up in the garage. Um, so it pretty much takes up the ground floor of the house. Uh, it's been really a nice change to have the studio at home. Uh, it took some getting used to. I've always had my studio outside of the house, but um, there's something nice about the um, the integration into the day-to-day -day life and that I can come down at midnight and, and if I feel like it, or I can get dinner started. And um, So there's kind of a better work-life balance uh, going on, which is a nice change. As a sculptor, I think about context a lot, uh, just physically how we negotiate a space and the objects within that space. Um, I also think about context in terms of um, placing objects in relationship with one another and uh, what kind of, uh, and what can be drawn out of that, those relationships and how um, sort of a slight pivot uh, of the body can, can change that that uh, that relationship. Um, I'm also interested in context uh, as it relates to um, site specificity and often my projects will um, will respond to the particular history of a space or even the dimensions of the gallery. Um, I, I always build uh, a maquette for the space that I'm working on and the space actually uh, becomes part of the conception of the work. And sometimes I'll insert uh, these loose narratives into my installations that um, they're very, they're very subtle and they work in the background, but uh, again, they, they sort of provide, um, they, they, they serve to reassert a set of assumptions, which is what I, how I think context can really uh, help. And, and same with the replica. I mean, the context, context and replica sort of go hand in hand in terms of their ability to uh, bring with them these, these commonly held assumptions. Sometimes it's as simple, um, these, these narratives kind of play out um, by simply um, placing a cup on a windowsill uh, so it appears as though it was left there by uh, a previous visitor. Or it could be, um, you know, an abandoned book in the corner of a room that's, you know, op flipped open to a page or a streetcar transfer kind of looks as though it's been left in the corner. Um, in the case of a show that I had at Oakville Galleries, um, I guess in 2015, um, I really used the history of the space um, uh, to, to reinforce kind of the exhibition or buttress the, the, the conceit of the exhibition. And uh, Oakville Galleries is a house that was turned into a gallery um, that I turned back into a home, but one that is under renovation. The entire gallery was uh, re-envisioned to look as though there was a, a room under construction uh, there were uh, construction materials kind of leaning against walls and um, and on windowsills and you know in corners of rooms, um, cardboard boxes, uh, packing materials. All of the work in progress were uh, were replicas of uh, made out of wood and acrylic paint. Um, so it was really this. I always work on a one-to-one -one scale with my replicas, again, because I'm interested in the double-take moment. I'm not so interested in, in distorting reality, but in, in playing with kind of um, the mistaken identity. Uh, 
but uh, in the case of Oakville Galleries, it was uh, one-to-one on an architectural scale. So the entire home was kind of enveloped into the installation and, and the context that the home brought along with it. So there's an element of, of choreography uh, involved in my work. And as I mentioned, um, the, the space of the gallery or even how the viewer's body sort of negotiates the installation kind of folds into the work. And, and because I work with everyday objects, there is this very naturalistic way that a, a viewer engages with them um, that is somewhat easy to anticipate or, you know, and so um, with my installations, I, 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 I have this sort of uh, natural or implied choreography in mind, and then I try to subvert it um, and insert kind of these stumbling blocks for the viewer, uh, which kind of helps to trigger this double take moment or this sense of, of um, uh, uneasiness or uh, disorientation, um, which ultimately leads to kind of seeing the work anew or seeing the object anew. I have a series of works that use uh, a double-sided mirror as uh, sort of this central component of the work. And I think those most overtly illustrate this performative aspect of my work. And uh, so there'll be objects arranged on either side of this double-sided mirror, um, and they're arranged kind of in perfect mirror image of one another. And on the one side, it will be objects in painted or rendered or replicated in full color. And on the other side, they're uh, drained completely of color as though you had run them through a Photoshop black and white filter. Um, so it's the sort of grayscale counterpart. And as the viewer like physically walks around the wor work, um, you can see the color draining in and out of the objects uh, when viewed in the mirror. So that's sort of a, a, um, a good example of how the work really relies on the viewer um, and their kind of relationship physically and also the assumptions that they bring to the work uh, kind of have to complete the work. Um, in my work, I'll often make reference to uh, art historical and contemporary art tropes. Um, and uh, I'll sort of, but using everyday objects in place of maybe more common um, art material, ex expected art materials. Um, for example, I have a, the Rubik's Cube has reappeared in my work uh, several, in several projects, um, but the first time I used it was uh, in a project called 100 Variations, in which I grayscaled a Rubik's Cube and used it as a modular unit uh, to create 100 different variations on 100 cubes, which uh, references Solowit and his structural progressions. Um, but unlike so Lewitt, who is interested in the cube for its lack of connotation and that it was void of meaning, I was drawn to the Rubik's Cube precisely for all of the associations that we bring to it, um, the associations of game playing, permutation, the grid, um, color cues, um, puzzles, um, and yeah, and permutation. And, you know, it's, it's a very rich, it, it, a very rich object. Actually, objects reappear in my installations uh, over and over again. I sort of think of um, each object that I remake sort of becomes an element in a, in a growing lexicon. And uh, just, like, um, just like words are components of sentences, the, you know, and, and they can be remixed in any number of ways uh, to create new meaning. I, that's how I, I see um, the, the objects in my lexicon as well. And uh, an object placed in a new context and in, in, in relationship with uh, different objects, um, it sort of, I, I, I guess I see this process as highlighting the flexibility of, of an object and um, how, uh, how much possibility is kind of inherent to um, 
how we read an object, like that there are many different ways to read an object in relationship to their context or how they relate to their surroundings. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I think of objects as having sort of more potential than what we um, typically associate them with. We usually have a pretty quick read of our, our you know, immediate environment um, and our brain kind of just has to work that way. It has to, uh, if we tried to process everything in our peripheral vision, we would go crazy. Um, so we, we do these really quick reads, but, um, but I guess I'm, my goal is to kind of slow down that, that process of seeing and, um, and open up the potential of the object. So I think of my work as being funny in some ways. <laughs> um, it's, it's a real, there's a real deadpan quality to my objects. I mean, they're, they're painted in a very matter of fact way. They're, they're like, it's flat um, paint that kind of absorbs the light and they end up becoming these kind of stoic objects um, or like icons of themselves. Um, but at the same time, I, I'll, I'll sort of just kind of present a hot dog or a toilet plunger. Um, and, and to me, those are just kind of inherently funny things to, to like spend time with. Um, but I also, I would say that my installations have an underlying structure, um, that, um, that kind of guides, uh, well, it guides the selection of the, the objects, um, but uh, it, the structure is a little bit like the choreography that I talked about, where um, there's a bit of a, a, like an acknowledgement of the assumptions that the viewer is bringing to the object or the context or the situation. And then there's kind of this, so that's kind of like the setup. And then, um, I'll have these reoccurring characters that um, that will kind of uh, come in and out of the the jokes each time, either playing to or subverting their archetype. Um, so it's kind of like one of those classic jokes that's told over and over again to different ends. Um, and ultimately, I think observational humor is kind of about um, taking. Uh, uh, a recognizable situation or like a relatable situation and reframing it in a way that makes the viewer think like why didn't I ever think of it that way and kind of re reframing how they view a, a set of circumstances or uh, a particular um, uh, situation. Um, the project Chalk to Cheese which was done in about 2016 um, serves as a good example of, of how my work functions in a number, on a number of levels. There's always an underlying structure to my installations. And in this case, I was working with the concept of the daisy chain. So Chalk to Cheese is a, a 16 foot long platform along which I've arranged over a hundred objects. And the objects link to each other through associations such as color, shape, use value, fuzziness, pointiness, um, and of course, wordplay uh, and the pun, um, both visual and linguistic puns. When the viewer walks along the table, the relationships between objects shift depending on their uh, point of view or perspective. This project really draws out kind of the way that I, I think about objects uh, as having potential beyond kind of their immediate ways that we uh, relate to them. So my work is really interested in kind of slowing down that seeing process and allowing for this uh, potential to play out and for all of these other characteristics to come to the foreground and um, become relevant. Um, and also the relationship between objects and how, again, my, it's sort of a good example of how my work is, is lexical in that um, the objects can be rearranged to, uh, like words, to, to arrive at different meanings. So in terms of the process of making the work, um, I had a few objects that served as anchors that I knew I wanted to make. 
Um, and then kind of like the game of snakes and ladders, I had to kind of find these, uh, link, the objects that would link, uh, that would provide the missing link. And um, so in this way, I don't have a lot of agency over what objects make their way into my installations. To some degree, um, they self-select and, uh, and it's, it's, an, it's a process of problem solving. That's an apt way to look at my work in general or my process in general is that it, it starts off as a puzzle that I have to solve in the studio and uh, becomes a puzzle that the viewer has to solve. Hi, my name is Dave Diamond. I'm a Toronto artist who has recently relocated to Sackville, New Brunswick, where we are now for a studio visit that involves neither a visit nor a studio. I don't have a studio. I've never had a studio. I can't imagine ever needing a studio. Most of my work is done on the laptop or farmed out to others, frankly. Uh, I have a small office in the house that I'll use sometimes, but I'm just as likely to be working here in this room or the dining room or the bedroom. And if I ever find myself uh, with a strong need to have a studio for a couple of days, I just can commandeer Rulas downstairs. My practice is primarily concerned with how culture is made, uh, what we do with it, how it uh, mutates after the fact, how it's rearranged. Um, it's a research-based practice sort of post-internet, post-production in the Nicholas Boread sense of the term. Uh, it's not media specific in any way. Uh, I tend to let the projects dictate their format, although obviously there'll be a lot of kind of cultural mirroring with the subject matter. So uh, books and records and videos and kind of cultural artifacts of distribution will uh, frequently make their way into the work. Uh, I have a bit of a collector mentality uh, in that I much prefer discovering things to making them. Uh, I always remember a quote from Martin Creed in which he says that something along the lines of there are enough things in the world I, I don't need to make any more or I, I have no compunction. I'm not compelled to make more of them. And I think that... Uh, for me, the, the art, if you will, comes from the sifting and shuffling through existing materials rather than creating something from scratch. So Pop Quiz, for example, is a work that began, uh, initially was conceived of as a book work and later became one, but ultimately began its life um, for financial reasons as a video, which was much cheaper to produce at the time. Uh, and that's worked out well enough in that the video allows the piece to grow, which is something that's part of, a, which is something that's a big part of a number of my works. Uh, the piece began, uh, I think when it first showed as part of Barbara Fisher's exhibition soundtrack, it was about 10 or 12 minutes long and the last time it was exhibited, which was last year at the Owens Art Gallery in town, I think is about three hours long. The work consists of every single question in every single lyric in my music collection. And they're left to linger just long enough to be briefly contemplated. There's an element of self-portraiture to the work and that it becomes a kind of Venn diagram of the overlap between my tastes and the tastes of the viewer. And the questions survive isolated out of context as a kind of surreal list of queries to consider. But Earworm also ends up doing much of the heavy lifting. I think ideally the viewer leaves the space with a song stuck in their head disguised as a kind of nagging question. Uh, there have been a few kind of offshoot projects from Pop Quiz, works that involve isolating text or um, questions, one of which was commissioned by the power plant for their 25th anniversary. Because I uh, often work with archives and my work is research-centric, 
there was a time when I was being invited to respond to a lot of archives, a hotel's archive, a, a grade school's archives, and this project for the power plant, which initially involved spending a couple of weeks in this dusty closet in which they stored countless bankers' boxes. And uh, the resulting work had three components, but the piece that, I'm, that relates to pop quiz is um, a work called Is It What It Is and Other Questions? And it was basically the first thousand questions that I found while sifting through those materials. And they were sourced from, I don't know, VCR manuals, guest book comments, questionnaires distributed to children, interviews by art critics with artists, correspondence, communiques, and so on. Uh, and some of them, you know, were quite profound. Others were fairly banal. The work was presented in the lobby reception area instead of one of the galleries so that it could co-mingle with, you know, promotional introductory signage. If it asked a question like, uh, are you a member? You might misconstrue it as a promotional vehicle, but then something, then it might be followed by, is it what it looks like? Or why is it red? Yeah, I think my favorite uh, of all the questions is, will there be a dinner? Because it just feels like the most honest thing on anyone's mind at an art opening. Postscript is another such work. It consists of a hundred written codas from the ends of movies uh, in which we catch up with the characters after we are no longer seeing them on screen. And I found one for the year 1900, one for 1901, one for 1902, uh, a full hundred of them so that the piece becomes kind of a portrait of the 20th century. Timeline from a couple of years later is a work that's actually a portrait of 20 centuries or more. Uh, it is a piece that uses the beginnings of films, the establishing shots, typically a landscape view in which a caption comes up and tells you the place and the date. And it begins, I think, in the year 17,000 BC and quickly jumps ahead sequentially throughout history. And by the time we get to around the 18th century, I think, every year is present uh, for about 400 years in total, I think. And it gradually builds towards the present day. And when it hits present day, rather than ending, it switches away from historical dramas into speculative science fiction clips and continues on for another 800 years or so. The edit kind of complicates the historical narratives and the inevitable ideological narratives that accompany them by having fiction intermingle with fact. So a clip featuring a 19th century painter or politician might be followed by an establishing shot from a horror movie about Dracula, for example, or there are time travelers throughout the piece, Doctor Who and so on. Um, so they sort of create these alternative realities and end up drawing attention to the way that histories are constructed uh, and that the idea that society itself is essentially uh, formulated, structured by narrative, it certainly holds more sway for us than fact. Uh, a piece I did for Nuit Blanche in Toronto a f number of years ago is called uh, The Day After, Comma, Tomorrow. It is a collection of explosions, attacks, typhoons, floods, and other natural disasters from literally hundreds and hundreds of films. And the work arranges the clips geographically across 24 different monitors so that the viewer can watch these sort of doomsday scenarios play out uh, around the world simultaneously. Tidal waves hit the shores, cities are destroyed, panic ensues. The cutaway reaction shots are removed, as are the moments of sort of utopian social cooperation that are invariably required in these films to survive the apocalyptic scenarios. So the piece kind of ends up looking like fireworks, just an endless barrage of explosions and destructions as the clips loop back onto themselves. Uh, Ear long do does did 
takes its title from uh, a bit of deliberate gibberish from the Smith song uh, from 1986, 85, Cemetery Gates, which is kind of a, an ode to plagiarism in a way by way of Oscar Wilde. And the Smiths are typically thought of as one of the most literate pop bands. And a big reason for that is that Morrissey would often include literary references in his songs, sometimes disguising them, sometimes pinching them directly from novels and uh, poetry uh, plays. A Sheila Delaney play features about 20 sentences that uh, Morrissey's worked into some of the, the earlier Smith songs. And I started collecting these. It took me about, I think, two or three years to find all of the books, several dozen of them. Uh, I've located within them the pages that contained the original source lines and scanned them, keeping the original page number so that they could be reprinted facsimile in the correct order. So if in the original book, the page number is listed as 84, then it's 84 in my book, which ultimately ended up adding another couple of years to the project. In the end, I think the book becomes basically an appropriated text about appropriation and, of course, about cultural impact and lineage. So another piece that kind of traces uh, cultural impact, this time in reverse, this project, Watching Night of the Living Dead. George A. Romero's uh, original Night of the Living Dead is kind of ground zero for the contemporary zombie film. It was shot on a minuscule budget in Pittsburgh over 50 years ago, uh, but just may be one of the most influential horror films of all time and certainly the most successful, influential, independent film, except that it didn't make the filmmakers a single penny. It was originally called Night of the Flesh Eaters. There was another film with, with a very similar title released the year prior. So when, uh, when the original title card was removed and swapped out for a new one, the copyright symbol was accidentally omitted. At the time, the, lo the laws had subsequently changed. But at the time, if you didn't have that circled C in your film, then it was, never, it was not protected whatsoever. People later realized also that it meant that if you were making your own film and you wanted to include a scene with your characters watching something on television or sitting at a cinema or in a drive-in, you could use Night of the Living Dead without expensive licensing fees or time-consuming administrative labor. So I started to wonder if I'd be able to compile enough clips to retell the original story entirely through scenes of characters in other movies watching Romero's film. Uh, here's a brief clip. Hey, come on, Barb. Church was this morning, huh? Hey, I mean, praying's for church, huh? Come on. I haven't seen you in church lately. <laughs> well, there's not much sense in my going to church. Do you remember one time when we were small, we were out here? It was from right over there. I jumped out at you from behind the tree, and Grandpa got all excited, and he shook his fist at me, and he said, Boy, you be damned to hell! <laughs> remember that? Right over there. Well, you used to really be scared here. Johnny! Hey, you're still afraid. Stop it now, I mean it. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Stop it. You're ignorant. They're coming for you, Barbara. Stop it. You're acting like a child. Look, they're coming for you. Look, there comes one of them now. He'll hear you. Here he comes now. I'm getting out of here. Johnny.
So the notion of extended time in uh, A Drink to Us When We're Both Dead and Timeline and a few photographic works that I've made um, exists not just as a subject matter, but kind of as a modus operandi in a way. I really am drawn to the long game, like a project that I can conceive of now and maybe be working on in 20 years time. And so I start a lot of those things that don't seem remotely feasible. Uh, sometimes they're abandoned, you know, until a deadline forces me to, to revisit them to see if they'd be actually possible in some way, shape or form. Like when you, f when that, when you find that connected tissue, that sort of central puzzle piece that animates all the others, makes the others make sense, make the project feel like it could actually come to life and come to some sort of fruition. Uh, then it goes from being like the dull detective work of an overnight stakeout to the exhilarating detective work of the chase, of the hunt, of that time when you're standing in front of your you know, chalkboard and all the pieces come together and you feel like maybe you, you have a project that's, uh, that's justified the time that you've pissed away your life on.